The Radio Wemo Breakfast. The best ideas are free with Ben Young from Boagie.com. Ideas, you can never have too many of them, especially on a Monday when you're thinking, oh, the weekend was great, but I don't want to get into the working week just yet. Ben Young is along Boagie.com, B-W-A-G-Y.com and Twitter.com forward slash Boagie. Hello and greetings. Good morning. Good morning. Today we're talking about something called the Uncanny Valley. Which okay. Is, so. Which isn't a place. No, well, it, it might it, be, but... It's not a place, and just like a lot of the ideas on the show, something pops up during the week, and then I, I revisit something I learned a few years ago, and I'm like, oh, I've really got to share this concept with other people. And so this week I want to talk about the Uncanny Valley. What is it? And, and before we get to what it is, yeah. let's look at what, what is something that's uncanny? Mm. What, what do you think something that's uncanny? Something that's uncanny. Uncanny would be... Um, my ability to talk this morning <laughs> that's that seems uncanny well especially especially at five o'clock this morning ooh, it was pretty cold this morning <laughs> yeah but, um uncanny means when you interact with something it's familiar enough for, for you to understand it but it's different enough that you can't quite rationalize it mm. and it feels a bit weird and um deja vu is kind of accounted to something being uncanny yep and if you sometimes look at these lifelike robots, at first glance they look real, and then you notice that maybe their skin is slightly plasticky, so then it becomes uncanny. And what happens is our brain tries to juggle with, there's something familiar, and I understand it, but there's something different, and I don't know what, what it is. Yeah. And so what we tend to do is we have two options. We can rationalise it, figure out what it is that is uncanny, or we can reject it. And knowing humans, we always take the easier route, which is just to reject it. Right. We just go, this is too unusual for us, and we shift on. Reject the humanoid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> reject the humanoid. Now, that, um, there was a guy called Fr- Frentz who wrote um, the theory of uncanny in 1906, mm. and someone followed up in, I think, 1976 about the uncanny valley. Now, what the uncanny valley is, it's, it's a graph, and in the middle there's a valley. On the left is something that's reality, and on the right is something that's animated. Okay. So, so it's, it's, not a, it's not an actual place where we go and throw all these objects yeah. into the <laughs> no, big no. dump. No. Well, so at the very left, it's complete reality. We understand it. At the very right, it's completely animated. Yeah. We understand that. So almost just like a regular movie versus The Simpsons. You know The Simpsons is animated, and you know a real movie is um, real people interacting. Yeah. And what happens is as you shift from reality to animation... Uh, it, like the the object becomes much more uncanny, mm. so we tend to reject it more. Mm-hmm. So this graph um, matches the po- uh, graphs the positive and negative feelings towards an object, and as you get close further away from reality and closer to animation, it dips at the bottom of the valley where it's completely uncanny, and we will just reject it. And so that might be like a lifelike robot. Have you, I've seen I've seen those. Yeah. Uh, uh, so particularly it looks in Japan. real. Mm. At, at half seconds glance, you're like, "Oh, there's something wrong there." Yeah. And it's at that middle where we'll reject it. Right. And there are other interesting applications of this. They we, use it as, in, a, as opposed to Avatar. Yeah. Characters in Avatar, which is right at the other end. We, yeah. We accept it because just they. Yeah, but some, it, for some reason they got it right. Yeah. If it was a l- little bit closer, and I'm sure they did a bit of testing around this, it might have been too uncanny for us, and we wouldn't have accepted mm. it. Now, they also use this in the gaming industry quite a bit, yeah. because the gaming industry for the past three, three coming up on four decades, has tried to make things as real as possible. But there have been points in time where games just haven't flown because they're a bit close to reality, but not close enough for us to understand it. So yeah. they're a bit uncanny. Mm-hmm. So with gaming, they do a lot of testing to figure out how uncanny it is, and if it's too unusual, they generally won't go with it. Okay. Um, and another good little example is with. And it's happening quite a bit is fashion magazines and photoshopping of models. Right. You know, yeah, you, which you, happens quite a lot. Yeah, so you, you'll look at um, all the models, all the covers. Now, we expect people to be photoshopped these days. It's not often that we see a picture and it isn't photoshopped, especially in fashion magazines. Yep. Um, but when they take the photoshopping too far and then suddenly they look a little bit alien-like, mm. that's where it becomes uncanny. Mm. They, they've taken us too far from reality. Yeah. All out of proportion. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I th- they sometimes have problems with this in regards to new cars, when new car designs come out. Mm. Because it's familiar, we understand what a car is, but it's so different, 
it becomes uncanny, so we tend to reject it. We reject the change almost. So it's not only um, it's human things, it's, it's objects. Yeah, because it, um, when something is uncanny, it's how we interpret it. So as it becomes more familiar, the mm. less uncanny it becomes. Mm. So I, I haven't done research into the Prius, but I understand that's something that they had to overcome when the, pre, when the Toyota Prius came out. It was just so different and weird that people couldn't rationalise it and understand it. Mm. So they had to wait almost five, seven years for it to become a bit more familiar and then people understood it. Silly humans. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> silly humans. But this happens quite a bit. Now, the applications for us is, well, are we doing something that's uncanny? How can we make it more familiar to people so that they understand it? Do we need to make it more lifelike or more animated and kind of realise that there is there is this void where people just won't understand it for some point in time? Mm. So to, to, just understanding that. So yeah. so what, what, do you, what do you need then? You need more people to adopt well, the if, product? Well, if, if you look at fashion, you need more people to adopt it to make it more familiar. And in and, and that instance, it's about talking to people's spheres of influence. So, for example, I'm not an early adopter of fashion. So I look to one of my mates who is an early adopter, and probably about six months after he tries something new, I might try it. Right. But if you swap over to my mate, he's probably looking at certain spheres of influence where all the new fashion is coming through. Mm-hmm. And it's- so to him... It's quite close, but to me, it's too. I'm too far removed from the source. So that's why often you see, you know, uh, alternative sectors of society testing out fashion first, and then it goes yeah. mainstream. Yeah, mm. exactly. Mm. So it's just the same kind of thing. All right. So you don't sit in the uncanny, uncanny valley at all yourself. Oh, I guess I do at times. It can be a good thing because then people will talk about it mm. because that they're a bit polarized. You know, um, here's this car, but I don't quite understand it. So you talk to others to try and rationalise and understand it. You brought in um, an, an iPad this yes, morning. Yes, yes. We were lucky for, enough to, to get to, one. To show off. <laughs> um, and uh, we, this this somehow doesn't sit in the um, in the uncanny valley. For some reason, we, we everyone's just, just jumped on board. They love it. Yeah, well, if you look at the amount of press the iPad has had. But also, um, Apple does a lot of testing. They have huge test groups where they test operating systems, interfaces, and that kind of thing um, to see how people react to it. Mm. Uh, Google does the same thing. Before they roll out a new feature, over 10,000 people in their testing group have tried it. Yeah, like the idea of touch, yeah. for some reason, seemed so so natural straight yeah. away. Uh, or if they tried to launch that eight years ago, it probably would have been too unusual. The yeah. iPhone, when it first came out... It was a bit uncanny on how it worked. Yeah, you know, I'll notice when I give someone my iPhone to play with, they'll they'll press it quite hard. Yeah, when really all you need to kind of skim your finger across, mm. and it's because it's a bit unusual. Because there were previous devices by yeah. other companies that were, yeah. you know, not exactly the same, but had that tablet yeah. idea, but didn't yeah. fly. Yeah, mm. and I would suggest that maybe they're a bit too uncanny and weren't user friendly enough for people to understand. Mm. Interesting. You can continue the discussion over at um, bwaggy.com, bwagy.com, and on twitter.com forward slash bwaggy. Thanks so much, Ben Young. Excellent.